Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest lecture session. Until now, we have been discussing the variables of interest to us, the relevant flows of interest to us and how the flows change with time or day, right. And then we moved on to discussing the headworks or the preliminary treatment. As in, we know that sewage typically is collected by gravity at the sewage treatment plant. If that is not permitted due to the relevant terrain, sometimes you will have what do we say pumping stations. So, at this particular sewage treatment plant, you obviously need flow of water from one unit process to the other. So, you typically do not want to pump it each time. So, you will uh, want the flow to uh, go by gravity or be driven by gravity. Thus, in the head works, you are going to have the relevant pumping station to pump the relevant water to the relevant head such that you know you are going to also take into account the friction losses and such. Then we looked at uh, what do we say removal of uh, grit and such, core screens and so on and so forth. But in the context of grit removal, we looked at anyway briefly anyway sedimentation, right. Grit relatively much bigger particles compared to the other uh, suspended particles let us say, right. We talked about sand, we talked about I believe coffee beans and so on and so forth. So, we talked about core screens or such, yes, but we also talked about what do we say rectangular, uh, what do we say basins where you have laminar flow conditions with a weir at the end, right, proportional weir or such, such that the flow is maintained, uh, constant flow such that, you know, scouring of only the suspended particles or organics is taking place, but the relatively heavier particles which are or which is the grit is settled down, right. We looked at this. In that context, we looked at this term or came across this term sedimentation. So, in the next couple of sessions or at least in this session, we are going to look at sedimentation in greater detail because that is one of the primary treatment process uh, that is going to remove most of your suspended particles in wastewater or water let us say depending upon the kind of water enemy, right. So, let us look at what we have here. As I mentioned, we are going to look at sedimentation and contents at least of this particular session and probably the one uh, after this session. So, why, why is it that I or what do I want to achieve out here, right. So, we have suspended particles relatively bigger, some smaller, you know some of these are inert, some of these have organic content, right. So, inert if you do not remove them, they will cause issues down the line in the other unit process by settling out, right and such and you are going to have relatively lesser effective volume also can lead to abrasion and wear of tear of your relevant uh, machinery yes so you don't want the inert content and typically the bigger or heavier inert content we remove during preliminary treatment or during the head works right so that's when we already remove most of the bigger inert particles but there will be some suspended what we see inert particles and also which are relatively smaller than grit and you will also have some organic uh, content which is suspended. So, organic content how do we remove typically? Typically, we will remove that by a biological process where microbes in the presence of oxygen are going to catalyze this reaction of oxidation of your waste. Our waste is the microbes food, right? Our waste uh, by oxygen, oxidation of our waste by oxygen and the reaction is catalyzed or you know the kinetics is improved by the enzymes released by the microbes. But here obviously, oxygen needs to be supplied. So, we are going to have to pump oxygen or air into the relevant biological process. So, when we are pumping air in obviously, you know that is uh, going to be a costly affair. So, if you have the relevant uh, sludge treatment available out there, you can remove a significant fraction of your organics here, not a lot, but a significant fraction of your organics here. So, that you know you less load is available on the relevant uh, or in the biological process bringing down the cost, but again it is not as straightforward as that you have to look at other aspects too. Okay, so, we are going to look at sedimentation, right 
and in the context of sedimentation depending upon the type of flow conditions, the type of particles you have different types of sedimentation, right. So, one is discrete and we looked at this in the context of grit removal. When we say discrete I guess people know what uh, discrete means. So, in this context we can think of it as what we settling of the relevant particles independent of each other, right. The, the particles which are settling do not do not interact with the other particles let us say, right. So, that is layman's term. So, typically we see this when we are looking at removal of grit, but again type 1 settling again all these are ideal case uh, what do we say scenarios and you are never going to have one uh, what do we say perfect example of discrete sedimentation. The second one which we are now going to look at in the context of primary treatment of wastewater as in when you want to remove these particles let us say which are not as big as grit or not as heavier as grit. So, you are going to look at flocculent settling right uh, wherein these smaller particles relatively smaller particles let us say by themselves they will take too much time let us say to settle down. So, what do you do? You add a coagulant or if the particles are good enough to be or not good enough or are going to settle down without the presence of or need for a coagulant that is also uh, one possibility especially in wastewater. But let us look at both the aspects typically these have charge and they do not let them come together let us say they repel right negative charge they repel. So, if you want them to come together and uh, coagulate and then form flocks what do you need to do? You need to add charge. So, you are going to add the opposing charge which is a positive charge. So, that is where when you look at addition of this is plus I guess that might not be clear due to the way it is being written. So, I am going to add a coagulant. Coagulant can be Al 3 plus right Fe 3 plus Fe 2 plus yes. So, now I am going to neutralize the charge on this colloids. Uh, so, coagulation and then these colloids now come together and form flocks right. So, flocks and then these flocks settle down and that is uh, typically the case in flocculent settling right. And sometimes if uh, or depending upon the size without the addition of coagulant 2 you can have flocculent settling right. Uh, and this is also seen in case of your primary sedimentation tank right, but that will also encompass what do we say hindered or compression sedimentation, but we will look at that later. So, flocculent settling type 1 and 2 type 2 settling and then hindered right and compression which we will look at in some detail later. Once we understand these relevant types of sedimentation we are going to look at the relevant variables and look at the relevant design let us say right. What are the variables of interest and how do we design let us say right. Let us uh, move forth. So, the sedimentation so, water as we know flows into the settling tanks where the flow is devoid of turbulence. Again we are talking about uh, turbulence and laminar flow. So, what do I understand by that? Laminar flow more or less it is squeezant flow as in the flow goes through in layers where you know there is little interaction between one layer to the other. There is little to no interaction between one layer to the other. But turbulence uh, let us say you know you see that usually let us say when you have monsoon or you know during the monsoon season and if you look at the canal you are going to look at turbulent conditions let us say you know it is uh, the flow is going to be violent you are going to have eddies and such and you know it is not certainly going to be laminar right. Here we are talking about at least in this context we are talking about uh, what is this now laminar flow. Why I guess if you have turbulence you know the scouring velocity and such you know the particles are never going to be able to settle down right. The eddies let us say they are going to keep uh, the particle up in suspension because they are going to be what we say carried along with the fluid of uh, or fluid flow. So, typical retention times are from 2 to 8 hours and what happened to these flocks or the particles they settle out and that is what we refer to as sludge. Let us say if this is my sedimentation basin. So, the bigger particles let us say are going to settle down right and this I am the settled out right. Uh, what do we say fraction we are going to call it as sludge one of the primary treatment stages what sedimentation. Again here uh, we are not looking at 
coagulation or flocculation that you are going to look at as and when needed. Here we are just talking about settling basins only, right. Let us move on. So, this is a typical picture. Obviously, the flow you see is pretty still, right. If you have turbulent conditions, obviously, your particles are not going to what do we say settle down or maybe think of uh, what do we say this room here. If I bring some dust in my or fine dust in my hand and throw it up into the air as in keep it in suspension and now the room is entirely locked, there are no fans running here and such, right. So, the particles are going to settle down let us say relatively faster. But once I throw this dust up into the air and I turn on the fans, I am going to create turbulent conditions, right. So, the particles are going to remain in suspension for a much greater period of time. That is one aspect or then that one way to understand why we are going to maintain these uh, laminar flow or quiescent conditions, right, typical sedimentation basins. Let us move on. So, I guess I wanted to show a video here and what is the, uh, who is providing us with this video? It is American Water Works Association, right. And just let us look at what we have and I will try to give the voice over. So, sedimentation and clarifiers, okay, fine. So, what is happening here as you can see the relatively bigger particles were settling down, right, relatively bigger particles they were settling down, right. I will fast forward as deemed necessary. So, relatively bigger particles or heavier particles are settling down, right, I should not just say bigger. And here you have relevant quiescent conditions or laminar flow conditions and you have the wares here all along. So, that this velocity is or you know is more or less is in the laminar flow region let us say right or this flow is in the laminar flow region and you are going to have the relevant settling during this particular period let us say right. And you can have rectangular or you can have circular what do we say sedimentation basins. Let us I think uh, we are going to look at the wares. So, here you have the wares let us say yes. different uh, kinds of designs, we will look at that later. So, an example of a circular one which we will come back to looking at, I believe we have a better picture, okay. Here we have the sedimentation, circular sedimentation basin or uh, circular clarifiers let us say, right that is what you see. There are two kinds of uh, what do we say circular sedimentation tanks, one is where the flow comes in through the center from the bottom to the top and flows radially or you know again perimeter uh, what do we say flows in from the perimeter. But typically in India I have seen that most people use the ones that come in from the center flow up and flow out. Again we will look at the relevant schematic uh, or graphic later, right. So, I guess this is what we want to look at. So, particular uh, what do we say schematic of this uh, sedimentation basin, the circular sedimentation. So, water is coming in through here with the relevant suspended particles and this influent zone, what is it that we are trying to do? We are trying to see to it that the velocity which is relatively higher here, you know by the time that it comes out here, let us see, right, comes out here, what is going to happen to that in the influent zone? What do we want to do? We want to see to it that the velocity of water comes down or the energy is dissipated right that is the major aspect energy is dissipa dissipated and there is uniform distribution of your relevant uh, what do we say flow and the suspended solids. So, that is what we want to do in our uh, influent zone and then here we are going to have this settling zone. Please note this because we are going to make some assumptions later. So, this is where you know some particles are going to be uh, settled down as the water flows radially from the center towards this effluent zone. Effluent zone again the design has to be such that you know the particles that have settled out are not carried over into the effluent zone, right. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind. So, influent zone, effluent zone, settling zone and then we should also have another zone this is called the sludge zone let us say, right, where the sludge is collected and then you have the hopper here. You see the hopper that is going to scrape your sludge and that is going to be uh, collected let us say, the sludge that is collected at the bottom is going to be collected. So, what do we have again different kinds we can have them inside or such right uh, circular let us move on and let me move on to one aspect I wanted to show okay to 
increase the surface area available we will look at uh, why that is needed as in height of your you know unlike what we might think height does not really play a role let us say height of your basin does not really play a role in determining the removal efficiency of your relevant what is this now uh, settle, settleable solids let us say but the surface area does but again we will look at this later. So, to improve that you can have what do we say plate collectors and such and I believe that is what we are going to uh, look at right different plate collectors here right. So, that the you know height let us say is going to be pretty less not let us say uh, meters or so, but only a few centimeters and you will still have the removal. So, that is what you see here. So, more surface area the settleable solids are going to settle down in this plate or circular uh, collectors and they are going to settle down out there and depending on the relevant design the sludge is going to be carried down right. So, enough of that let us move back to our presentation. So, that is one schematic. So, different types of settling the ones we looked at until now were mostly flaw type 2 settling, but I just wanted to show the kinds that we are discussing here right. So, type 1 or discrete settling what are the major aspects as I mentioned you know the particles are not interacting with each other they settle as discrete particles right. So, no interference and more importantly when there is no interference with each other no flocks are formed as in one particle is here here they just go through the like this as in they do not come together and they do not form flocks this does not happen in type 1 settling let us say discrete settling. So, where does this occur in pre sedimentation for sand removal grit removal or coagulation in surface water plant let us say ok in surface water plant. Again filtering bed settling in a grit chamber of the wastewater treatment plant as we mentioned earlier let us say right let us move on. So, as we know right gravity is pulling us down you know it keeps everybody down to earth right. So, here we are going to look at Stokes law which more or less again uh, looks at uh, what we say application of gravity right and what do we have here let us say we have relevant particle of different any size let us say what is going to happen the gravity is going to pull it down and the buoyancy I guess is going to push it up right. This particular drag force or let us say the frictional force on the relevant particle right gravity minus buoyancy. So, at the terminal settling velocity when there is no acceleration right will be equal to this right. This force pulling it down will be equal to the frictional force let us say. So, you can think of that. So, we can just apply it and what is it obviously going to be depend upon it is going to be depend on the density of the water density of the solid the relevant shape the relevant uh, volume the relevant surface area of the particle and then the coefficient of drag I think ok we have that and we can plug that in and get a relevant equation and for a sp spherical right here for a sphere right we can have the relevant uh, what we say settling velocity which we will derive from this equation that is going to be this. So, let us look at what are the relevant variables here. So, settling velocity or the terminal settling velocity of that particle. So, obviously as we mentioned what is it going to be depend upon obviously gravity that is a constant but what are the relevant uh, other constants here density of the sphere is a variable obviously density of water is relevant uh, constant right and what else density of water out here right coefficient of drag and then the diameter of the sphere as I mentioned we are modifying the equation we get from this particular derivation for a sphere let us say right and that is what we have out here. And this is applicable uh, in general everywhere, but again we are going to look at applications in the context of sedimentation for laminar flow right. Let us look at what we have out here. So, discrete settling so again as I mentioned the gravity and buoyancy is going to be what do we say the force pulling it down or the particle being pulled down will be balanced by the drag force or the frictional force. And Mr. Stoke, so thus the Stokes law will give us this equation, but in which conditions is this equation uh, what do we say relevant let us say. It is relevant when the flow is laminar and in general for determining whether a flow is laminar or turbulent or in between transitional flow we look at the Reynolds number. So, if the Reynolds number 
is less than 1, the flow is deemed to be laminar flow, right. So, we will apply the Stokes law only when the flow is laminar and the particle is a sphere, let us see. So, that is something for us to uh, what we say keep in mind. So, look at this and again you can uh, look at this equation too, let us see, right. So, that is what we have again only for uh, laminar flow. So, one aspect to note is that this Reynolds number is depend upon the diameter of the particle, the kinematic viscosity and the settling velocity of your particular particle, right. So, what does it depend upon let us say? let us say water let us assume this is constant function of the diameter and the settling velocity. Let us keep this in mind we will uh, come back to this again right. So, here from this particular reference what do we have? We have the relationship between Reynolds number and the coefficient of drag for different spheres let us say sphere, different types of particles spheres or different shape particles pardon me discs and cylinders. So, again you can look at the relevant uh, equation and understand this. So, again you see that for different uh, differently shaped particles the behavior is going to be different. So, here we have the laminar region yes when the Reynolds number is less than 1 right and then here we have the ter relatively turbulent conditions let us say right. And again we are just trying to look at uh, the different uh, profile because as we see it is depend upon the shape of the particle too right. So, here is the coefficient of uh, drag which is decreasing with increasing Reynolds number. Let us move on and this is from the Davis book and what do we have? We can calculate our uh, the coefficient of drag in terms of the Reynolds number. So, for relatively higher or uh, what do we say Reynolds number where the flow conditions are turbulent, I believe coefficient of drag will be something like 0 0.4 if I am not wrong right. We can check this later. But in the laminar flow region, right, the relevant coefficient of drag will be equal to 24 by r, right. So, again coefficient of drag is 24 by r and we know that Reynolds number is equal to the diameter of the particle, settling velocity of the particle by the kinematic viscosity, let us say, right. So, that is something to understand out here. So, what do we have? We have the equation for coefficient of drag in the laminar flow conditions coefficient of drag out here in the transitional flow right and here we have the profile for the Stokes law which is applicable only in the laminar flow conditions. So, again we have coefficient of drag on the y axis and Reynolds number on the x axis. So, here we have laminar flow and then some transitional flow and then turbulent conditions out here let us say. So, what do we see? We see uh, three kinds of data here at least in this particular initial uh, what do we say part of the graph initial half of the graph spheres observed right and the relevant equation and then for the Stokes law let us say right. So, what do we see out here? We see in the laminar flow conditions obviously, there is a good uh, agreement between observed and the relevant laws and the equations, but then you see the divergence. Uh, being apparent in the transitional and certainly in the turbulent conditions let us say right. So, again in the type 1 settling we are concerned with the relevant laminar flow only and for spheres that is something to keep in mind right. So, let us uh, move on ok. So, laminar flow Reynolds number uh, I mean coefficient of drag is depend upon the Reynolds number and transitional flow and so on and so forth let us say right. Okay, as I mentioned 0.4 that seems to be the right value and I believe we calculated the Reynolds number to be equal to uh, not calculated we know that it is equal to the diameter of the particle settling velocity by the kinematic viscosity. So, now how do I get this settling velocity? So, I have my Stokes law Stokes law relatively simple, but as we know Stokes law is applicable or very well applicable only in the laminar flow region that is what I see out here. So, assuming laminar flow conditions I am going to calculate the Stokes I mean uh, settling velocity from the Stokes law ok for that particle uh, shape and not shape uh, size let us say. Based on that I am going to calculate the trial Reynolds number. If this trial Reynolds number ends up being less than 1 fine I can go ahead with my relevant calculations and such. But if this Reynolds number turns out to be more or much more than 1, then what do I do? 
I it is an iterative process right. As in with this Reynolds number I will calculate the coefficient of drag whether here or here right and then go ahead and calculate the relevant settling velocity from the Newton's equation if I may and then I will again calculate the Reynolds number and see whether that is uh, what we say more or less applicable to my particular case or do I need to again uh, change the relevant uh, coefficient of drag and then I will come up to a particular uh, point again iteratively where I can come up with my or calculate my settling velocity and the uh, Reynolds number right. So, that is something that I can uh, do out there right. So, that is something to keep in mind. Let us move on. So, ideal sedimentation basins uh, there are some assumptions first thing is we are talking about type 1 that is why discrete and then as we looked at the relevant uh, what we say video we have inlet zone, outlet zone, sludge and settling all these are general aspects as I mentioned inlet zone we are going to try to achieve even distribution of flow but that is not always possible and this outlet zone we are going to say again even uh, what we say distribution of flow when it is leaving the settling zone. But one aspect which we will look at later is that the we assume that the particles are uniformly distributed throughout the depth of the relevant tank as in let us say this is my tank and here is my flow rate and this let us say is my settling zone. So, what I am saying is all these particles which are bunched together at the inlet are going to be uniformly distributed across this particular depth of the settling zone let us say depth of the inlet zone let us say right. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind and particles that enter the sludge zone are captured and are not scoured back up particles that enter the outlet zone are always removed that is something we need to look at or consider. So, particles that enter this outlet zones as this is the settling zone and this is the outlet zone and if a particle is deemed to have entered here we assume that it is leaving the system. So, let us look at the common types of sedimentation uh, basins here we have upflow right upflow yes. So, what do we have here fluid is coming up at this particular point and velocity of your particular liquid is given here and this is the settling velocity of your relevant particle which you will calculate from your Stokes law let us say. Initially the velocity is higher here, but out here at the top I am increasing the surface area right. So, what will that lead to I know that Q is equal to uh, the velocity of that particular liquid into cross sectional area. So, for a smaller cross sectional area the velocity will be higher, but if I increase the relevant cross sectional area for the same flow rate what is going to happen the velocity is going to decrease velocity of the relevant flow rate is going to decrease. So, that is what we see here it is relatively higher and here with a greater surface area right the velocity of your particular fluid flow is going to decrease let us see. Why is that necessary because if not if the fluid flow is pretty fast and my settling velocity is this or relatively lesser right obviously the particle will not be removed or will not be settling down but the r net is going to be such that you know the particle is going to flow out with the relevant uh, liquid right so only if my settling velocity is greater than this particular vl if i may call that out here right vl will my particle be removed right so that's something to keep in mind so, let us see or let us look at some of the terms out here ok maybe I will look at that later. So, we have different kinds of upflow right different kinds of upflow and then we have what we say rectangular uh, sedimentation basins too. Let me discuss this in somewhat uh, greater detail. So, what do we have we are talking about upflow sedimentation basins right and what am I concerned with the velocity of flow of the liquid and the settling velocity of the particle which I will calculate from my Stokes law which we discussed earlier and Stokes law as we know is only valid for laminar flow conditions that is something to keep in mind. So, what is the velocity of this uh, liquid going to be depend upon right it is going to be equal to what now the flow rate of the relevant liquid flow rate Q right units can be meter cube per second or volume per time let us say right volume per time by the cross sectional area which cross sectional area am I concerned with this surface area at the top I am going to say that that is A s. So, what do we have this is nothing but 
the overflow rate, right? Surface overflow rate, that is something for you to uh, keep in mind, right? So, this is the surface overflow rate, right? So, if my particle settling velocity is greater than or just equal to the surface overflow rate, 100 percent of the particles will be removed, right? All those particles with a settling velocity greater than my surface overflow rate, right? Again, this is the surface and the velocity at this particular point, I guess, we are calling that to be the surface overflow rate, right? The flow is going in this direction because it is upflow. So, if all those Vs having greater than or equal to uh, or being greater than or equal to V naught, right, will be removed. Those particles with a settling velocity less than V naught will not be removed, everything or 100, 0 percent will be removed, right. Either it is 100 percent or 0 percent removal, though in practice it will not be the case, but theoretically that is what we see, right. Let us see what we have. Upflow clarifiers, that is what we just discussed and overflow rate or I guess another term I should have mentioned earlier, hydraulic as in water surface loading let us say, overflow rate or hydraulic surface loading and these aspects we uh, just uh, discussed. Let me move on. So, this is with respect to upflow. What was the second kind that we uh, came across though? We came across the rectangular, what do we say, sedimentation basins or the flow in the horizontal direction let us say, even for circular basins let us say. So, there we are only concerned with the settling zone, I am not concerned with the inlet zone, I am not concerned with the outlet zone, but one aspect to remember is that all the particles we are assuming are uniformly distributed and any particle that is not within this sludge zone which is at the bottom, right and which leaves this settling zone even here is assumed to leave the relevant system, that is something to keep in mind. So, let me uh, what we say note down a few variables here. Let us say this height is h and length is l and if I look at the top view, right, this is the length and the width is this, let us say, right. So, what do I need to look at now? Let us say my particle is coming in out here, right and the worst case scenario, not worst, if it is just about to be captured, it can travel, you know, it can even if it comes till here, we are assuming that it will be captured, let us say. So, what is it that uh, is available or what is it that needs it needs to do, the particle I mean. So, it needs to traverse a distance of h during the time that this particular water or particle stays in this particular tank, let us say, right. So, that is what we have, right. So, let us see, you know, what it is that it is uh, dependent upon or such, this velocity, let us say, h by time for detention, let us say, right. But what is h? I mean, h is the height, and what is this time of detention? How will I get that? Let's say, right? Time. How can I get that? Let's say I know that q is volume per time. Let's say, right? Q. So if I say it's v by q, right? Volume by volume per time. So I can get the relevant time. So I need to divide by v by q. Pardon me. This is not theta. It should be q. So, that will be equal to h q by volume, let us say, right. And what is the volume going to be equal to? Let us look at it h into q volume equal to length into width into height, let us say. So, what is uh, going to cancel out? Yes, height and what are we going to end up with? It is q by l w, right. So, that is what uh, we have out here, right. So, as you see here, first aspect is that though it seems counter to intuitive, this velocity let us say that we are calculating out here, which will give us an idea about the cutoff for the relevant particles, right. It is again similar to the relevant surface overflow rate, which we calculated for the upflow relevant upflow clarifiers. There too, we had our surface overflow rate was q by surface area, and here too, you see that this is nothing but q by the surface let us say right, surface right, surface area. So, this is our what do we say surface overflow rate for the rectangular basins, but unlike the case of the upflow clarifiers, upflow is where we have the flow up there. For the flow where we have I mean where the flow is horizontal, we are not going to just have 100 percent removal or 0 percent removal, this is not going to be the case. Why is that? 
because here the assumption is that all the particles are uniformly distributed across the height or this particular cross sectional area let us say right. So, if a particle that comes out here with a settling velocity just equal to v naught that will be removed fine, but if it comes out here let us say or uh, with a lesser one let us say I guess I should have drawn a better uh, figure or let us say v let us say it has to be such that v s is v naught by 2 or uh, 2 v s is v naught let us say and this particle is out here right. So, this particle let us say is traveling at a v s such that it will just be removed at this point right, but we see that it came in at h by 2, but what about the particle that comes in at h that will not be removed right this parallel line let us say as we can see that particular uh, what do we say that particular particle which comes in at height h will not be removed as you can see it is going to leave right. So, it is we are not going to have 100 percent or 0 percent removal, but we are going to have fractional removal. So, that is going to be given by V s by V naught into 100 percent the percentage removal like this right. So, that is something that we will have to look at. So, what do we have rectangular basins particle removal is dependent on the overflow rate which we just uh, looked at and obviously as I mentioned or we mentioned settling velocity right settling velocity must be sufficient that such that it reaches the tank or the bottom or reaches this sludge zone right during the time that the water resides in the tank that is something that we looked at and what did we do we calculated this and we came up with our we with our surface overflow rate right and we looked at this particular case as an uh, v naught out here just captured and if the settling velocity is uh, such that it is v s equal to v naught by 2 I guess that is what I corrected earlier is not it ok. So, I should have written it the other way then I guess right this is for the case where we were talking about h and h by 2 right where the uh, settling velocity is relatively lesser let us say and it is lesser such that earlier case we looked at v s equal to v naught and now we are saying v s equal to v naught by 2 let us say right v naught by 2 right. So, what do we have if it comes in at h by 2 we see that it will be captured, but that fraction of the particle which is above let us say it will not be captured right these flow paths are going to be like this. So, this is escape this is escape. So, that is why we would not have the 100 percent or 0 percent removal as discussed in the upflow clarifiers, but we are going to have a percentage removal and that is what we see out here let us say right. So, let us move on. So, circular sedimentation basin 2 what is it that we see we see that it uh, comes up in the center and then flows radially here again horizontal flow itself. And typically if we look at the relevant design the rectangular basins make the best use of the relevant cross sectional area or the area available let us say right. But the what do we say circular basins are preferred because relatively low maintenance let us say uh, again this is with respect to the hopper system I guess right and uh, relatively low cost. So, thus people go for the relevant uh, what is this circular sedimentation basins, but if you are looking at the design and the effective use of the uh, what is it area the uh, rectangular basins are typically better right that is a no brainer if you can think of this what we have out here and the particle distribution radially let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, we are going to look at effect of uh, depth on removal ratio, but looks like I am uh, almost out of time. Uh, we will discuss this in the next uh, session, but again uh, we were looking at type 1 and uh, you know in that context we saw that the critical aspect is the surface overflow rate let us say right both for your upflow and for your rectangular basins yes and uh, thanking you for your patience I will end today's session.